East Palmdale on 30th Street has what we call the Palmdale Reclamation Plant. This is a plant to reuse drain water. Today we're going to take a tour of the plant and learn all about it and all of the um, water saving things that this water is used for. The Drew plant has been here since 1953 and it's it's in this location and we started treating uh, three quarters of a million gallons a day, 750,000 gallons a day treated at this plant. Now in 2016 we're up to 12 million gallons a day that we're, we're rated at. Currently we're treating about 10 million gallons a day. So we're more than 10 times bigger than we were when we started in 1953. And our process has changed quite a bit as well over the years. Um, this, the, the plant you're going to see today is a modern uh, conventional activated sludge treatment plant with nitrification and denitrification. I know that's a lot, but what that means is that we put the water through enough processes to actually meet drinking water standards. Now we don't drink the water directly out of this plant. We don't drink the water, but it does meet drinking water standards. It meets all the drinking water standards, and can it be used? It can be used for everything else other than direct drinking. Meaning we can irrigate any kinds of crops. We can we can irrigate fields, schools, golf courses. We can do everything with this water, except we don't drink it directly. Okay, so it's a great resource, and it can. And since it can be used for all these other things, the more things that we can use it for the more of our drinking water we can save and use for drinking in, in, in our homes. So what we, what we hope is that over time, most or if not all of this water will be used uh, by the community to offset <coughs> uh, drinking water. And currently, we're actually beneficially using 100% of the effluent from this plant. Now, um, countywide, the the water reclamation plants really only beneficially use at this time about about 40 percent of the water that's treated. That only about 40 percent is beneficially reused. The rest of it ends up in the ocean. And the reason for that is because of a lack of pipelines and a lack of infrastructure to get that water to where it needs to be. Now the sanitation districts, we do not build pipelines that go out to the community. Those are built by the local water purveyors. The Palmdale Water District here has been very proactive, has, been, has, has started to build pipelines, and we're currently going to McAdam Park. Who knows McAdam Park? Okay, so it's, it's right down 30th Street there. Um, McAdam Park is completely irrigated now with recycled water. And in, in the near future, it's going to be expanded to Dominic Missouri Park and other parks throughout, throughout the, uh, the area. And, and there are a lot of other bigger uses planned. Uh, but it takes time and it takes building, building pipelines. Uh, but we are currently re beneficially using 100% of the water from this plant. And guess where it goes? It goes to agriculture. Every drop of water that comes from this plant either goes to McAdam Park or to alfalfa fields. Well, in the wintertime, we also uh, send it out to barley, oat, and wheat fields, which are winter crops. And then, uh, and then the, rest of the, the rest of the year, it, it feeds alfalfa to the tune of about 2,000 acres of, of, uh, of agricultural lands where this water goes. So our water here is 100% is beneficially reused, whereas throughout the rest of the county, again, it's only about 40%. Why? Because we have pipelines in place to get that water where it can, where it can be used and not just disposed of. So it's beneficial reuse for, the, for this water. So that, that's, that's a great step forward for Palmdale that, we're, that we've been able to do that. So, I just want to show you a little bit about the tree of plant. You guys can come in closer if you like. Uh, this is a diagram of our process. And all the water comes in through the main trunk sewer. And because Palmdale is very flat, and because, and because sewage we want it to flow downhill, right, um, the sewer that comes into this tree of plant is, about, is a little bit more than 30 feet deep. So it's pretty deep underground. And the first thing we do is we come into a pump station. We pump this water up. And we run it through um, through some pretreatment, 
And this first bit of pre-treatment just gets rid of the real big stuff. Two by fours, rags, things like that that somehow end up in the sewer system. So the first thing we do is we get rid of the real big stuff. And this is a physical process because we're, we're basically screening, which is a physical process. Um, and as we go through the plant, you'll see that we use physics, biology, and chemistry. It, this, at its heart, this is a biological plant, but we employ physical processes, biological processes, and chemical processes by the time we get through the plant. So the first step is, is biological or physical. We knock out the big stuff, then we knock out the grit. And grit is stuff like sand, metal, um, and grit also includes coffee grounds, eggshells, things like that. Things that are dense, that can really fall out quickly in the water. Um, and, you know, it's a sewage treatment plant, so we have toilet paper, feces, things like that, that don't settle so rapidly. But, so imagine how slow that might settle versus particles of sand, which are real dense and would, and would settle quicker. Um, now, we know that a big cannonball and a little cannonball fall at the same rate, right? You guys remember that? Now, you know, because of gravity, they fall, a, big, a big mass and a little mass fall at the same time. That's not true in water. When you put things in water, now you've got drag forces, and so they fall at different rates depending on how much drag there is. So, um, but in an aerated grit chamber, those, those particles settle quickly compared to, you know, like, like um, say, lettuce. Lettuce is, gonna, is, is either going to float or settle very slowly, where sand and metal will, set, will uh, fall very quickly. One of the main reasons we want to get rid of the grout or the, the grit is because it will scour it will scour our equipment, sand and things like that. Imagine imagine taking your bicycle chain and putting sand in it and then turning your bicycle chain. That's not going to be very good for your chain and sprocket, is it? It's going to it's going to erode and scour. So we want to get rid of all that type of grit first to protect our equipment. Now, um, the first main process that we get to is, and when I say the main process, it's good. It's it's the the big the biggest. The first time we get to a real big tank is our primary settling tanks, and we call them settling tanks. But we really do two things. We both float because some things in sewage float and some things in sewage sink. So in the primary tanks, we remove the floating material, which we call scum or uh, uh, or skimmings. And uh, but scum is really a technical word. We have we have you know we have scum hoppers, scum beaches, all our scum equipment, and that's all the stuff that floats to the top. Uh, and then what settles to the bottom is the settleable solids. And so we remove the stuff from the top, we remove the stuff from the bottom, and what's in the middle then is the primary effluent coming out of the primary tanks. And at that point, we've removed about half, about half of the original organic load or about half of the original suspended solids. So just this process knocks out about half of the stuff. So that's the primary settling. Now, the solids go down uh, and end up in anaerobic digesters, which are giant, giant concrete tanks that you'll see outside. And these are very much like our intestines. Uh, they operate about the same temperature, uh, 98 degrees. Now, we operate at 99 degrees in our digesters. Our bodies are what? 98.7, 98.6, something like that, right? Uh, we operate at 99, so it's very much like our bodies. Um, we also make the same gases. It's an anaerobic digestion. We, it, these make the same gases as our bodies. You know, our bodies make a little bit of gas, right? And those gases are methane and carbon dioxide. We make those exact same gases in, in our digesters. So these are really just like us in our intestines, very much like us. Same temperature, same processes, um, very much the same types of microbes um, that, that we use here in the treatment plant. So that's where the solids go. The water that's, that's had 50% of the stuff removed from it now goes on from the primary tanks to the secondary tanks. And, the, and, and so do you think the primary tanks are, are physical or biological? Physical. Yeah, because we're because we're floating and settling. Those are physical processes. When you get to the secondary process, now it's biological. Now, biological meaning that our waste is mostly organic stuff, and there are microbes, little critters that will eat that stuff. Right? Micro microbes will eat all kinds of organic material, won't they? So what we do is we employ these microbes and lots and lots of them in order to eat our waste. So our waste is their food. And so we know about how many pounds of waste come into the treatment plant every day, and so we just need to make sure we have enough microbes that are able to eat that amount of food. 
Now, I'm about 200 pounds. Okay, maybe 185 or something like that. I'm roughly 200 pounds. I probably eat about, including drinks, I probably eat and drink about five pounds, six pounds a day. Think about that for a minute, about how much you eat and drink a day. It's probably, you know, I, I think you'll find that it's probably, you know, somewhere, somewhere close to that. If you're much smaller, you know, if you're a baby, you're not going to be able to eat five, six pounds a day. But if you're an adult, you're getting, you know, big, person, you're growing up, you can eat, you can eat a lot, right? And so, but it's based on how big you are, really, isn't it? You know, the bigger you are, the more you're going to eat. So, we know how many pounds of waste we have, which is the food for the microbes. So, how many, how many microbes do we need in order to eat that amount of food? You see what I'm saying? So, so you know, we, we have to make sure that we have that many microbes available and hungry, ready to eat, so that they can eat our waste. And that's how we treat the water. So in these tanks, we harbor and maintain um, thousands of pounds of microbes that are hungry and ready to eat our, our, our waste. It's their food. And that's what happens in here. And we also um, have to make sure that it's a really diverse population of microbes. We have to have a lot of diversity. Because what's in our sewage? What is toilet paper made out of? It's paper. It's like wood. It's a wood material. So that's cellulose, right? So there's there, so the kinds of can, can we eat and digest cellulose? Can we eat and digest paper? No, but but we can eat carbs and proteins and things like that, right? Well, so in in the microbial population, we have to have a real big variety of microbes, each of which are able to eat different parts of the waste. Some of them specialize in fats, oils, and greases. Some of them eat proteins really well, some eat carbohydrates really well, some eat cellulose really well. So you have to have all these different kinds of microbes in order to eat all the different stuff. Okay, so in, in, a, in this tank we have all those different kinds of microbes and they eat really well. We feed them real well and they serve us very well. Now these are aerobic microbes, meaning that they use oxygen. So in order to keep them happy and keep them eating, we have to give them a lot of oxygen because there's not enough oxygen in the water, dissolved in the water, to sustain that many microbes. We have to add a lot of oxygen uh, in, order, in order to keep them happy, keep them going. So when, when, we, when we walk the plant, we walk by these tanks, it'll look like the water is boiling. But really what we're doing is we're just pushing a bunch of air in there, just aerating. How many of you guys have seen a fish tank with the bubbler? Have you seen that? You know where the, and that's because... The fish will use up the oxygen in the water if you don't keep adding it. Right? You have to keep adding it or the fish will use it up and die. So you have to, you have to continuously add, and because the microbes are a lot like fish. They pull oxygen out of the water for respiration. So we have to add lots of oxygen into our tanks. So when you see those tanks out there and they look like they're boiling, they're not boiling. That's just air we're adding like in a fish tank. Except for in a fish tank, you just have a little thing that you plug in the wall, a little bubbler. But in, in our plant, we have hundreds of horsepower of, of aeration pushing just mass quantities of air into these, into these aeration basins. Okay. So in these aeration basins, they spend you know, somewhere around, around four to six hours eating. And then, and then they move in. Luckily for us, by the way, luckily for us, these microbes are also a little bit heavier than water. They're a little bit heavier than water. So the next thing we do is we go into the secondary settling basins. And in this basin, we settle out those microbes that just ate all that food. So in the primary basins, we're settling out sewage particles, you know. And you know what's in sewage, right? You know what the particles are that are in that. So in this tank, we're settling out sewage particles. In this tank, we're settling out the microbes that ate the sewage particles, okay, or what was left. Because here we want to get rid of the suspended stuff. So if you get rid of the suspended stuff, what's left? The dissolved stuff. Now, microbes can only eat dissolved stuff, right? Because a, for a microbe to eat, it has to pass the food through its cell walls. And you know that, you know that microbes have cell walls, like bacteria. And so, uh, so that's how that works. Um, so we, they're, they're eating the dissolved organics, and then we settle them out. Now, there might be little bits of microbes left that don't quite settle perfectly. So what we do is we run those through filters. Now, most treatment plants have... Um, coal, anthracite like charcoal and sand filters. This plant is very unique in our system. We have cloth filters. And these are what the cloth filters look like. These, 
We're the only treatment plant in our system, the LA County Dis Sanitation District system, that currently uses cloth filters. So the water is for it looks like carpet, doesn't it? Uh, but we force the water through that. Is there um, an advantage to using cloth? Um, one of the advantages is that uh, it's impossible to for the material to break through. Like the, the it, it's if if you're not watching your filters real carefully, it's possible for them to be overloaded and pull solids through the filter. Now, now, you, you, you'd really have to not be watching for that to happen. But that that's impossible to happen with cloth filters. Um, what we're really doing, the real thing that we're doing with these cloth filters, is trying to see not not, not if they perform better. But if they're less expensive to operate, that's that's the real that's the real challenge here. What we're trying to find out is it, not not if we get better water quality, but if they're cheaper to operate. And so, so we run through filters and then we disinfect and we disinfect with chlorine bleach. That's what we do. Okay. So um, so that's just kind of the basics of how the treatment plant works. Now, if I can focus your attention over here for a moment, a real veteran treatment plant operator and our superintendent Steve Johnson. Hi. Um, as Rick said, uh, I've got 35 years experience now. Um, I started out in 1980 down at our plant in Carson, <clears throat> 350 million gallon a day plant there. And I've progressed up through, uh, through the lines to where I'm now the superintendent of the four facilities out here in the desert. Um, we're going to go for a quick walk around the plant so you'll get to see everything that Rick described. Please remember we try everything we can to make the place as clean as possible. It's a wastewater plant, so keep your hands away from your mouth. When we come back, I want to make sure everyone uses the bathroom, washes up before you get in your own cars, okay? Do we have any questions before we even start? Uh, you talked about two treatment processes. This, this is a tertiary treatment plant. Yeah, the filters, those cloth filters, that, I'm sorry, that's the tertiary oh, part. Right. So the primary is the satellite, <coughs> the secondary is the biological, and tertiary is the filtration. Yeah, so that's what makes this a tertiary plant. Yes, thank you. I have a question. <coughs> On those cloth filters, I read that they will uh, filter the micro, the plastic microbeads, whereas the other process does not. Is that correct? Actually, the other filtration processes do remove a lot of the microbeads as well. Okay. Um, we just had one of our uh, uh, research staff running a microbead study on our facilities and found that we were doing very well at removal of the microbeads. One more quick question. Um, approximately how often do those cloth filters need to be changed? How long do they last? They, they have never been changed at this point. Um, they've been in service now for about five years, and we recently did have one rip that as soon as they see an uh, instantaneous change in the amount of turbidity coming out of the filter, and they can't seem to clean it with washing, they know that there's a problem, quick inspection, and they can find a problem. What, what I understand from, from, uh, from what I've read is that depending on how much, how much uh, chemical goes through it, um, they may, we should expect them to last, I think, seven to ten years. Something like that. Does that, yeah. does that sound correct? That's right. I think seven to ten years. Okay. But that's one of the things we're trying to prove out. Right. And, that, and that goes into whether it's more cost effective. Yeah. Okay, one last question, then we'll get our walk over. Where do you get your supply of microbes to put in and keep adding to? If, if you have a plant which you're starting from scratch, you'll get it from another facility. I see. Otherwise, it self-generates? Yes. When we started this plant in 2010, we brought our microbes up from the Valencia Water Reclamation Plant, which sits right next to Magic Mountain. Yeah. And, and that's how we seeded this plant. And we brought them up to 5,000 gallon tanks. Let's start, let's start walking this way. A little easterly. As Rick mentioned, the flow comes in from the sewer systems to a wet well, which is basically underneath us now, about 28 feet below your feet. It's then pumped up to plant level, and from here it flows back toward the back of the facility. This is the uh, preliminary treatment system right here. This is where we get rid of plastics, rags, things that will plug up the smaller pumps that are inside the plant. As we go up here and go past, you'll see our bar ring. What it is, is it's a bunch of bars that go down into the sewage stream. It has a mechanical rake travels up, it pulls everything that won't make it through those rakes, or through those bars, excuse me, off. It then gets put into a grinder where it's ground up, it's compressed, and it winds up in that dumpster right behind you. As we travel up, you'll be able to take a look at that for a moment, you'll be able to see what's going in there. 
Behind it is the grid chamber where we remove coffee grounds, eggshells, sand, things that will tear up the pumps when we're trying to pump whatever the fluid or the sludge is in the system. Okay? Let's go ahead and walk on by. themselves are 
down underwater. And what is happening is we put the secondary effluent from the clarifiers into these filters at a specific level. That pressure of the water forces the water through the filter and it comes out and goes off uh, toward the uh, chlorine contact tank. These filters are cleaned for about 24 hours. They uh, just have water run through them backwards. We take clean water, run it through it backwards, and that water goes out to the basin where it gets another attempt. You can see how clean the water is through the filters. And we're over the chlorine contact tanks now where we disinfect the water. So let's go ahead and head back down the stairs and around the corner. Cleaner than pool water. <laughs> what we do is we add hypochlorite, sodium hypochlorite, to the water to disinfect it. Make sure there's no pathogens, kill any bacteria, anything like that. You do not get instantaneous kill on some bacteria. It takes a while. So we have to maintain a chlorine residual in these tanks for a certain period of time to meet uh, our requirements. It takes a couple hours to make it through these tanks. There's only two tanks back here, even though it looks like a lot more. It goes in one, goes all the way down, comes back, it loops through the serpentine, and comes out after it passes down that way. Okay? Come on over this one, you'll be able to see the effluent. Wastewater plant can take takes about 10 million uh, or produces about 10 million a gallon every day year round. So how do we how do we balance that out? Well, what, so what you're going to see is both our ag site and our storage reservoirs. And what the storage reservoirs do is hold most of that water all winter. And and the storage reservoir we're going to we're going to visit is almost a billion gallons. It's it's uh, 900 million or 0.9 billion gallons of storage. And that allows us to hold all that water all winter long in the colder months and then use that water in the summer, in the warmer months when the plants are thirsty. And so what you'll see in those reservoirs is that they fill up and drain annually. And 
right now our reservoirs are almost full and our reservoirs will probably peak out about the middle of March um, at about 900 million gallons or just under a billion gallons and then by September early October the reservoirs will be nearly empty so as we approach 50th east coming up here you'll start to see our farm sites on the right hand side of the bus so if you're on the left hand side of the bus just kind of peer over your neighbors and, uh, and you'll be able to see what our center pivots how many of you have seen farms that are just all big circles giant circles everywhere that's because of the way the irrigation is it's a it's a center pivot where the water comes up from the middle of the farm and a giant arm swings a radius that, that sweeps around and forms that circular pivot or that circular field. Um, that's called a center pivot. The center pivots you're going to see are a quarter mile radius. So these pivots or these fields are about a half mile in diameter. Now directly ahead, you'll see that those that's line irrigation. These are either carrots or onions here ahead of us. But to, to the left of us, right here, is the first of our fields, which is an alfalfa field. And you'll see that all of our fields are circular. The center pivot irrigation is the most efficient type of irrigation currently available, other than drip. Here to the north of our plant. And, um, and the problem with having that much open water surface is the fear of bird airstrikes birds hitting airplanes and birds are attracted to migratory birds in particular are attracted to our reservoirs so these reservoirs are about nine miles from the treatment plant and that again is to protect aviators from bird airstrikes And, and which, which is not easy to do, 
But when you have circular pivots, there are spaces in between, the diamond-shaped spaces, the corners on the corners. And in, in, a, in a real paint, we can, we can plant the corners. One of the other things that we can do is we can do uh, additional agar of bleaching because, because crops require not only the adapto-transpiration beans for the plant, but they also need some bleaching to push the salts that accumulate in the root zone. Because when, when plants take up water, they take up what they need but leave salt behind. And so uh, in, a, in a year where we might have to do that, we can we can do uh, more agronomic bleaching. Um, and then and then um, and then all in a real, real pinch, what we can also do is go back to some of our local oxidation ponds that we used to use, which can hold about 150 gallons of water right on site. Now that would be our very, very last pitch effort to hold water. Um, at, at, to date, we've never, we've never even seen the vision pass. So we've never had to do any of those things. But we do have plans in place where if we had just a deluge of water that nobody expected, just like a real, you know, geologic level rain here. And, and that, that's the order that we would do things. That's right, that's right. And and we and and we've only built two of the five reservoirs that are designed for this complex. So there are actually three more of these in the plans to build on this one mile square area. So we're, we're only two fifths of, of our reservoir capacity. We have it already in our plan to build three more of these. So you're welcome. Thank you for the question. Okay, any other questions? Thank you.